In April of 2019, I released what is now the most infamous negative review of the God of War reboot, and the following year I expanded on it with a second part focusing on specific issues and what I believe to be the motive behind certain creative changes. The lead up to God of War Ragnarok on my end has been a constant stream of people asking if I expect to hate it or if I think it's going to be better, how could I possibly make a follow up that lives up to that original video in just a few weeks when that video took me a year. Well, all I can do is try. This is how God of War Ragnarok was ruined. While my initial trailer reaction certainly skewed towards the negative side, as I was disappointed to see that not much had changed, I have honestly been excited for the release of Ragnarok. I stayed away from any other previews, I only heard bits here and there about changes made to the combat system, they were touting the new verticality the game offers, there was supposed to be more enemy variation. So before I start talking about what this game does right and wrong, I want to say that I'm not going to be repeating too much of what I've already said. I will get into certain familiar territory with things like the camera, but I'm not here to complain endlessly that you can't jump. Yes, I still hold the same view that no aerial combat options ends up limiting the game significantly. Yes, it's still awkward to see areas you should be able to jump to, but you can't. Yes, I still think this game's combat would be far more interesting with a resource management system like the originals, where you have to find magic instead of it being on a cooldown. I am also not going to talk about how this game doesn't have a combo meter, because the problem was never that there wasn't a combo meter. The problem was the lack of any effective system at all to encourage experimentation, the way an XP rewarding combo meter can. Now there is a good system, it just isn't a combo meter, and we'll get into that soon. Ragnarok has been the most mixed and inconsistent gaming experience I've ever had. We're going to talk about the good, the bad, the amazing, and the terrible. Perhaps we had better start from the beginning. <laughs> I picked the second highest difficulty, Give Me No Mercy, because I wanted a very challenging combat experience, but I wasn't fully prepared for pure suffering on the very highest difficulty because I knew this was already going to be a very long game. And after I finish it, I can replay it on the highest difficulty, better understanding the combat. We start the game, and the first 10 minutes is a bunch of cutscenes and a driving section with button prompt QTEs as Freya comes for her revenge. It's fine, I was expecting this. It's nice that you can actually fail these QTEs and die if you're not paying attention. I took that as a good sign, and at least we aren't slowly dragging our feet as we carry a log this time. Unfortunately, the rest of this sequence is completely fake. You can steer the sled, but it's unnecessary. You can just keep your hand off the controller and the sled auto-steers for you. Coming off the sled, I noticed an immediate improvement. Roll the clip. Can I swing this axe on my back? No. Wouldn't want to let the player break the immersion of this walking scene. All right, time to test it. Get off the sled, take control of Kratos, and wow, would you look at that. I'm actually allowed to press buttons and see what they do. This was a criticism very specific to my video, and this change is something else I saw as a good sign. They're not forcing me to walk around unable to see what my character can do until they say so. There's no enemies here, but it doesn't matter. I want to see what the buttons do, and they let me, so thank you. The moment I was able to experiment with my combat options, I lit up with optimism. One of my principal criticisms with God of War 2018 is that you are so limited with what you can do in the starting hours that it makes combat feel really one-dimensional, especially when you compare it to the originals, which we're going to do right now. Just looking at God of War 1, in the first level you have light attack and heavy attack with three different combo enders, block and roll, an air launcher with an air boost follow-up allowing for focused combo damage in the air, an air grab for extended juggles, a ground to air grab for bouncing enemies, and three different grab options that gave you fast kills or throwing enemies around to control space. It wasn't an overwhelming amount of options, it was the perfect amount to experiment with as we're learning the game. 
God of War 2018 stripped away so many of these options without replacing them in the early game. So on your first playthrough, all you had were light and heavy attack, axe throw, fists, parry, and dodge. It was all so basic. It was hard to get excited about. It led to an absurdly boring troll fight and an almost equally uninteresting boss fight with Brody or whatever his name is. Just hacking away and dodging. No other options. And once you did accumulate some more interesting combat options as you're making your way up the mountain, the game was already well on its way to becoming broken due to how badly balanced the RPG mechanics were in combination with a ridiculous amount of runic attack spam and busted Atreus electric arrows. Ragnarok, on the other hand, has completely remedied this. Right away, you have access to an axe ability that charges up a heavy freeze attack by holding triangle, applying frost, and we have sprinting attacks. It's amazing how much of a difference this makes in getting started. In just one hour, you get the blades. You have access to two blade grapple attacks that bring enemies into you and auto-launches into the air, or charges them with an explosive from far away. The blades can be spun around vertically by mashing triangle for combo juggles, or for swiping attacks or splash damage attacks. This went on to be my favorite attack, due to its ability to interrupt enemy animations and apply burn damage. They definitely want you to use this because they have an area that specifically tells you about it, and it can be significantly upgraded. As soon as you start upgrading skills, you have enough XP to unlock the ability to do extra damage against enemies with elemental effects, further utilizing the new elemental abilities using Triangle, encouraging weapon variation, and you can unlock the God of War 3 Hyperion Grapple attack that brings you to the enemies, providing a great mobility option. There's like triple the combat options right in the first hour and a half of the game, and I started thinking, wow, some of my biggest problems in 2018 have already been addressed. This is great, this is enjoyable, and maybe I'm just imagining it, but it feels like enemies are hanging in the air a bit longer for combo opportunities. We are quickly introduced to the new vertical combat option, Death From Above, where if you run off a ledge and attack in the air, you come crashing down on the enemies below. It's nice, I appreciate the inclusion, and I appreciate the more vertical design of some of the combat spaces, with ledges you can climb up and points to swing from. It's a noble effort at making combat encounters more interesting, but I gotta be honest and say I don't think it adds much to the gameplay. There aren't many fight spaces with these vertical levels, and it basically comes down to fighting on level 1 or going up and fighting on level 2. It's the same thing. Without a jumping option, attempts at verticality are pretty underwhelming. It's fake verticality, and it doesn't do much for me other than remind me of how much better the combat would be if I could jump. And if I could see. The camera is still just the worst. The video here doesn't really communicate how it feels to play this game, so let's bring it in a bit. A little more, a little more, there. That's how it feels to play modern God of War games. Uncomfortable. In a game where enemies are frequently running to your side and behind you, you're steering yourself like a tank and directing your attacks like you're playing a third-person shooter. It's just the worst. It makes so much of the game, combat and exploration, feel so claustrophobic. And it's made infinitely worse by the fact that Kratos can't attack in any direction other than right in front of him. Many viewers of my channel will be familiar with my dislike of melee action where you have to control the camera. But it is far more tolerable in a hack and slash game like Bayonetta or Devil May Cry or a brawler like Sifu, where yes, you have to move the camera, but you can also move your character in any direction. If an enemy is to your left, just attack to your left. If an enemy is behind you, do a backwards attack. You don't have to reposition the camera. Ghost of Tsushima did this just fine. Why can't God of War? Here you have to turn the camera towards whoever you're fighting, and it's just as tedious as it was in 2018. If not more so because of some of the new enemies. While I do like their designs, they tend to run all over the place and zoom past you. 
You have to rely even more on the terrible indicator system to react to colored arrows for enemies off screen. It creates a state of paranoia when you're trying to kill an enemy but you've got arrows telling you that something is coming but you have no way of knowing what it is or exactly when it's gonna hit or if it's an unblockable attack. So you just gotta stop what you're doing and reposition yourself just to see. It's so tedious and it ruins a lot of the combat momentum. When you're fighting a couple enemies that are in your view, things can work pretty well. You can focus on the damage you're doing while being ready to react to any incoming attack to dodge, parry, or interrupt. That's when combat feels the best, but you can still end up struggling to target who you want when the enemies start moving about. And the problem isn't that it's mechanically hard to focus on one enemy, it's that so many enemies will surround you and attack you from behind, so the combat becomes about managing your view more than feeling the energy of the fight. If you put yourself in the middle of the action, you're gonna have to be flipping around to cover your ass. And there's a horrible bug where after you do specific animations, if you try to quick turn, the game will forget the block input and instead read the down input first, causing you to come out of your quick turn animation with your fists instead of your weapon. I bet I just cleared up something for a lot of players wondering why they suddenly weren't holding their weapon. You can test this yourself. Pick up something from the ground or run and do an axe drop and hold block as you're coming out of the animation and start tapping down to quick turn. You'll see that your weapon is gone after the quick turn finishes. Infuriating. Watch here, holding block during the end of the execution, Kratos starts pulling out his blades instead of blocking like I'm telling him to. Next, the down input causes him to pull out the spear, and then the game recognizes the block button I've been holding for the past two seconds and lets me quick turn, now with the wrong weapon. The controls just feel unresponsive sometimes, on top of the general clunkiness this game has. There were a lot of times where I hit the weapon switch button, but nothing happened. You also can't switch weapons while blocking. If you have the axe out and you're blocking, you have to let go of block and then switch weapons. When you really should just be able to come out of block with a different weapon. I guess because it's not realistic, but you can switch weapons while rolling and that's not realistic, so what the fuck. You also can't run while switching weapons. If you're running and you switch, Kratos stops running, which is just terrible and awkward. There's just a general lack of input buffering that makes things feel wrong. If you press the buttons to deactivate Spartan Rage during an animation, it doesn't cause Spartan Rage to stop once the attack finishes. You have to wait until Kratos stops moving, leaving you just standing there burning your meter for nothing. And the worst is when you throw your axe, but then you do a takedown animation and it shows Kratos with the axe. And then you go back to not having the axe, but you just saw yourself with the axe. So you try to do a magic attack, but it doesn't work because you haven't recalled the axe yet. The axe that you just saw in your hand, it's confusing. Getting back to the camera, in a way I think they're aware of the camera issues because a lot of the game is actually focused on one-on-one -on -one boss fights, and that's where this game shines. The best part of God of War 2018 was the Valkyrie fights. Well, really only on New Game Plus, because in the regular game you could just rune spam them to death even on the highest difficulty. 2018 only had three boss fights in the campaign, and they mostly sucked. The first Brody fight sucked, the giant dragon was nothing more than throwing balls at him and hacking away at his toes, and the final Brody fight was okay, I guess. The trolls were everywhere, the first one sucked, and the rest of them sucked too. They know this, that's why there's an awesome joke troll appearance where Kratos just immediately kills it, sending a clear message to fans that they know the trolls sucked and they won't be appearing in this game, except for a few appearances later in side missions and that's fine, by that time they die super fast. It's nice to see Santa Monica have a sense of humor about their game's faults. This time around, the number of boss fights in the main campaign of Ragnarok is truly impressive. There must have been, what, 10, maybe more? Plus dozens of optional fights. And now that you've got the spear, you have more ways to engage in combat. I don't enjoy the spear that much as a normal weapon, but I like the runic attacks. When a boss flies away from me, I chase his ass down with the spear, and it's so satisfying. Boss fights are awesome because you finally don't have to worry about enemies attacking you from off screen, and you can just focus on fighting an interesting opponent. 
In Ragnarok, it isn't 10 minutes before you fight a boss, the bear, and it's cool. It shows off the defensive mechanics of the game really well, way better than 2018's introductory troll. And after the next cutscenes, we get to battle Thor. They're really opening the game strong. It's like how God of War 3 had you taking on Poseidon as your first enemy. Combat feels better, camera problems are minimal for a while due to the multiple one-on-one -on -one boss fights, and we've already met both Odin and Thor. We meet up with Mimir, and I love that he's just living in Kratos' cabin now. I guess he just sits on the table all day. We're treated to a dream sequence where we see Kratos' wife like we should've in the first game. I never cared about the mission to spread his dead wife's ashes, cause we never got to see her or see how Kratos feels about her. Now we do. Too bad I find her quite unlikable. She reminds me of this person, who I strongly dislike. She even has a moment of dialogue that's exactly like this character. But I really like the portrayal of Odin and Thor. They feel very authentic to this world. I like seeing Thor as a large drinking viking, and I particularly like seeing Odin as just a normal guy. He's not some commanding presence, he's just the guy in charge. A normal old man who has authority, and cares only about his control. I'm no expert on Norse mythology, I'm sure there have been many interpretations of these characters. If anyone is upset by this interpretation, I'm not saying you're wrong. But after all the years of only seeing the Marvel versions, this was refreshing. And then we start the central conflict of God of War Ragnarok. Atreus is searching for Tyr because he wants to know more about the giants and his destiny as Loki. And Odin wants him to stop. Kratos says no, Odin goes on to manipulate them both. And that's about it. This is Atreus' story, and the story of everyone else. This game cares little for the character of Kratos, as he is relegated to being a man following his son's reckless ambitions. This is not Kratos' mission, so much like the last game, I found it very hard to care about what's happening. Not liking Atreus certainly didn't help. In the first cutscene, Atreus is already yelling at us. It's incredible that they start this game with Atreus whining. And it's not about the dialogue, I understand they have to set up character conflict. It's about the delivery. Atreus' issues could have been delivered in a much more conversational, non-shrill, non-bitchy way. But the way they write this character is abrasive and annoying. Now look, Atreus isn't as bad as he was in the first game, because he's not a whiny 8-year-old brat. He is a little older now, his voice isn't as irritating. I tolerate him more this time around. I wish they had made him older, like early 20s. Yes, I'm aware that Fimblewinter only lasts a few years, but you may recall that this is a series that plays with the concept of time. Kratos opened portals in God of War 2 that took him to the past. Just in the last game, he entered a portal in Alfheim where he experienced time differently than Atreus. If Santa Monica really wanted to, they could have easily found a way to age up Atreus by having him get lost in some time portal and pop out the other end in his 20s, and I really wish they had. By the way, I refuse to believe that this part isn't a jab at my video. In my original video, in the section where I talked about how much I hate Atreus, there's a part where I talk about his annoying way of speaking, and I show a montage of him saying whatever. This kid even says whatever when he gets pissy. Whatever. 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 It says, don't wake him. Whatever. And then we have this part in Ragnarok. Whatever. 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 Hey! Don't run Whatever. off! Whatever. Can you tell me Whatever. where I am? Whatever. Whatever. It is a very clever way of taking a dig at me, I must admit. I'm sure some of the developers have seen my video by this point, and if they were going to respond in any way, this is a brilliant way to do it. I approve, I love it, I laughed really hard when it happened. I suppose it could be coincidence, but I doubt it. Anyway, I still don't like this kid. I don't like walking around with him, and I don't like how much of the game is dedicated to him. I do enjoy the moments where Kratos expresses his feelings for him, but that's because I care about Kratos. Seeing him smile as he witnesses Atreus becoming independent put a smile on my face as well, and is one of my favorite moments in the entire series. I don't like his kid, but I feel for Kratos, and I am moved by the scenes where we see how much he loves his son. And some of my favorite story moments come from these interactions between Kratos and Atreus. But there's something off about his face, and the way he talks immediately spoils the mood of dramatic moments. 
Things that should be serious in tone are undermined by his nonchalant attitude. Hello. Hello. I lost count of how many times I got absorbed by the story following these legitimately interesting characters when Atreus has to butt in and make some comment and ruin the whole scene. It's really frustrating because I like everyone else a lot, and I can easily imagine a God of War 2018 and Ragnarok where Atreus is not a part of any of this. Kratos could have just been a lonely man in the woods dealing with his demons when he comes across Freya after he wounds her pig during a hunt. And there we go. Atreus is searching for what it means to be Loki, eventually going on to try to stop Ragnarok, and Kratos is just along for the ride. Isn't that a compelling narrative for our beloved main character? Toss in a few flashback scenes with his dead wife where they talk about how he's scared to have a baby, and I guess you have a story of some kind. The story depends entirely on Atreus, and unfortunately he's the Jar Jar Binks of God of War. Early on, you can just tell that this little puñetas is going to be the cause of every fucking problem we encounter. And he is. Everything bad that happens, happens because of him. He sneaks out at night to go on his own adventures, always disobeying orders. Everything he does is in service of himself, and everyone suffers because of it. Hey, that sounds like Kratos' behavior in the old games, doesn't it? Yeah, but the difference is that when it's Kratos doing it, he's the main character, we are sympathetic to his story, he's actually likable and interesting, and his games have a fun, not-so-serious tone to them. Here, every moment following Atreus is boring and annoying, and it's telling that the most compelling moments of the story come from characters rightfully scolding him for his selfishness and his foolishness, for being the burden he is. It's glorious. I gave you everything. My skills, my friendship, my home, my secrets, my treasures, and you just kept taking. And now what have I got? We. There is no we. There's only you. No matter what the cost. So what you can do is get the fuck out of my sight. Oh yeah, that's good stuff. I could watch an hour of that. The campaign is constantly interrupted by Atreus sections because, oh yes, this time around, Santa Monica Studio has made it clearer than ever that what they really want to do is make the Atreus game. You take control of Atreus like seven times, I think, and it's almost always bad. The first mission is kinda alright, it's interesting to see how this character moves and fights. The remarkable thing is that he plays much better than Kratos in this camera style. Because like I've said before, this camera style is made for shooters, not melee action games. This is how Resident Evil 4 is supposed to control, not God of War. Atreus is so agile and he has strong long range options, it's like the game was made for him. The first time you fight with Atreus, it's actually liberating compared to how clunky and immobile Kratos is. I mean, he didn't used to be this way, but, you know, immersion, I guess. Atreus can shoot lots of arrows, inflict major stun, dive out of the way while shooting, knock enemies on the ground while in combo. He's pretty cool to control. That is, until you realize that almost all of the combat encounters with him are heavily tuned in his favor. He recovers a lot of health from just one pickup, he does a lot of damage, and most of the fights are just super tame. They're pushovers. I'm trying to figure out why they did this. Why make Atreus so powerful and brain dead most of the time? Are they trying to make us think he's really cool by making him kick so much ass easily? Most of the combat here is trivialized and it's boring. Playing one mission was okay, I can do that. But mission two is the worst part of the game. It is, in no exaggeration, an hour and a half of unskippable cutscenes, following dogs and talking to yourself, walking around and listening to a girl talk, skipping stones on the lake, occasionally fighting wimpy enemies that don't stand a chance, looking at paintings, carrying seeds, talking about paintings, walking, opening chests, talking, riding a bull slowly through the marshes, bad combat, talking, picking up apples, riding through the marshes some more, talking, running around, riding a bull, talking, fighting bugs in the dark, 
picking up more apples, walking around, talking, more bad combat, playing the most pathetic and uninteresting boss fight in the game, running through the fields as a dog in a part that plays itself for you since you don't even have to press the analog stick, and listening to the most annoying sound ever recorded in human history. An hour and a half of this? You really think Atreus is so interesting that we're gonna be happy to put down everything and spend 90 minutes doing this shit? Fuck off, Santa Monica, fuck off! You know who you remind me of? These people. Their heads are so far up their own asses. It's the only explanation for this. It's the only explanation for the next Atreus section where all you do is walk around Asgard listening to people talk for 15 minutes after pretending to climb the Asgard wall. Yes, pretending to climb. When I saw this wall and heard Atreus say he was going to climb it, I thought, no, there's no way they're going to make me fake platform up this giant ass wall. But oh yes, yes they are. Acting like we're supposed to be impressed by this epic quest, which I'm sure plenty of people fell for. Oh wow, look how high I'm climbing. It's so dangerous to be doing this. But for me, it's more like they were openly laughing in the face of everyone who had an issue with the fake platforming and boring climbing sections of God of War 2018. They make you climb this massive wall, but you can't fall off. There's no way to grab the wrong section or lose your grip or even voluntarily walk off the fucking edge. Because this game refuses to allow any kind of consequence outside of direct combat and QTE moments. Even Uncharted, the game that arguably started all this cinematic gaming nonsense and easy as piss auto platforming trend, let you make mistakes and fall to your death. There's gotta be some kind of actual danger to platforming sections or there's no reason for them to exist. And just to insult us a little more, they say, oh, are you getting bored with pretending to climb a wall? Here, shoot some bubbles, isn't that fun? Now get back to climbing. The fact that you literally cannot fall completely destroys the illusion of danger, and turns this entire section into a pointless series of holding directions on the controller and hitting circle when it says so. It is awful. It's the kind of moment that truly reflects the times we're in. Because 20 years ago, a moment like this would have been a 90 second cutscene, where we get some epic camera angles and dramatic music showing an exciting montage of Atreus scaling the wall. Short, to the point, fun to watch. But we're in the age of cinematic gaming now, so every single moment of climbing and walking has to be some fake interactive sequence that's not only unskippable, but is dragged out due to playing out in real time since it isn't subject to editing, it's uninteresting to watch because there's no intentional camera direction, and it's immersion breaking because people can be talking about the most serious thing in the world while you're dicking around with the camera. This is why the unbroken single camera style of this game is an utter failure, because it leaves zero opportunity for editing, which murders the pacing. And far more than it did in the last game, because there's just so much more of it. This game is incredibly long, which doesn't have to be a bad thing, but there's like 20 times the amount of unskippable cutscenes, and they're so long, and there's so much walking around and talking. And that's not the only thing that ruins the pacing of this game. They also ruin it intentionally by placing a traversal puzzle after what feels like every combat encounter. For the majority of the campaign, and even in many side missions, the game is terrified to give you more than one combat encounter. Large portions of the game are fighting three or four enemies, and then spending the next five to ten minutes walking, talking, climbing, watching cutscenes, and solving puzzles. And then maybe you get to fight another three or four enemies before going through the whole process again. It isn't until much later in the game that they finally start consistently delivering combat. Their world and story is so important that we have to take a break after almost every fight, no matter how basic and unsatisfying it may have been. Because the combat encounters are generally unsatisfying for significant chunks of the game, due to how infrequent they are and how frustrating the camera can be. Oh, and some people gave me crap for exaggerating the camera problems when you get close to walls? Yeah, I don't think so. This stuff happens plenty, and it sucks every time. <laughs> Oh! <laughs>
I'm not saying all the combat encounters are bad. Some fights are okay. Sometimes there's interactable objects to use against enemies, like giant rocks or throwing the axe into crystals to reflect into them. It makes things feel a bit more dynamic. And when it feels like you have more control over the situation, namely by keeping things in camera, fights can feel good from time to time. So it's not all bad. I mean, anytime you have to fight worms or floating bubbles, it sucks. But some of these fights are pretty good. And it's almost always the boss fights. The opening levels present you with multiple boss fights. The bear, Thor, the huntress, which was pretty fun to fight. The Drekki, of which you fight multiple later. Two enemies at once really is the maximum that this camera style can handle. The game delivers boss fights pretty steadily throughout the campaign and open world, and I honestly enjoyed nearly all of them. There are beefed up mini bosses scattered around, and there's these great optional berserker boss fights that can be very challenging. Some of these guys took me a couple hours to take down, and it forced me to get good. It was the best part of the game. If I had one criticism for the boss fights, it's that I wish there were more puzzle elements involved. Having to use pieces of the environment or something like that. I always come back to God of War 1, where you had to stun the Hydras and then climb up to impale them so they stayed down while you went after the big guy up top. Stuff like that is fun and makes boss fights more than just block and attack encounters. Bosses have unique attacks that you have to adapt to, and one thing I love is that they made me think more about what runic attacks I wanted to use. See, in the last game, I complained about it giving me so many runic attacks when I can only use one for each runic slot, and none of it mattered anyway because the game was so broken. This time, due to much better combat balance and better enemy design, I was thoughtfully exploring my options to pick the right runic attack for the situation, something I really enjoyed. Sometimes a runic attack I like using would leave me too vulnerable in a fight, so I'd switch it out. So the problem was never that there were too many runic attacks in the last game, it's that there were so many while feeling like it didn't matter in the first place. This time, it does and it feels good to have options, especially since it feels like I'm not breaking the game with any of them. The RPG elements have been toned down and slowed down in terms of how they're introduced. The whole green, blue, purple rarity system we see in every game today isn't plastered all over the armor page, so I'm actually looking at these different pieces instead of going directly to colors. Wonderful, now I don't have to think Fortnite while playing God of War. I can just hear people complaining already, where's my epic purple axe handle, bro? The biggest change is the removal of enchantments. Sweet lord in heaven, they actually took out the enchantments. 2018 buried you in like hundreds of these things that gave you little stat boosts, and it was exhausting. And you couldn't sell them, so they just sat there. They're gone now, because we don't need to be thinking about equipable enchantments as we're figuring out the armor system and the combat. Instead, what they've done is consolidated all these enchantments into an amulet that you find much later in the game. It has nine slots, only one open at first, where you can put enchantments that you start finding. And as you play the game, you'll be able to repair more slots to have more enchantments equipped. And there aren't dozens of crappy plus two strength enchantments lying around, they all have significant clear uses. Introducing this later in the game instead of in the beginning is a fantastic change. It doesn't feel overwhelming, it feels like a natural extension of this game's progression. And I enjoyed working with it. Being able to equip three enchantments of the same type to get a bonus perk was also a very nice touch. The only addition I don't care for much is all the different companion upgrades. You're given so many ways to buff the arrow attacks that I found it confusing and ultimately I just stopped engaging in it. You're given too many too fast that it starts to feel meaningless. The improvements to the inventory are appreciated. Now, whenever you open it, you are immediately notified of what can be upgraded or crafted, so you don't have to open everything individually searching for upgrade opportunities. Still, I don't like this armor system because it goes against every design principle that defined Kratos as a character. When they first started designing him for God of War 1, they started with a lot of armor but eventually realized the more armor they took away, the more intense the character looked. Kratos is not a man that needs to be covered in armor. When he's stacked head to toe in cloth and metal like this, it hides the character design and it's a real shame. That's why the most powerful moment in this game is when Kratos takes off his armor. He should look like this the whole game, I don't care how cold it is in Midgard. I mean he's walking around like this in the beginning, why not keep it stripped down? 
I should be exploring this world as Kratos, and the more armor I have, I feel like I'm not. And I need some kind of motivation, because it's so easy to find yourself going on and on in this world, doing nothing due to how huge it is, and how many parts involve rowing your boat or climbing walls. And the map doesn't help things at all. I can't believe I never mentioned it in my first video, but this map is terrible. I know you're not going to have a GTA style waypoint system that shows the path you need to take to your objective, but you at least need to allow me to zoom into the map to understand where I'm fucking going. What supervisor at Santa Monica looked at this map, saw how little it zooms in, and said, yeah, that's good, we don't need to go any further. It's like the designers don't want you to understand world traversal, and that makes the fast travel system much worse. Yeah, you still can't fast travel from any point. If you're out in the middle of nowhere and you need to get to another realm, you have to march your ass across the map to find a magic door, and then you can travel to another point in this realm or another realm. Yes, it's nice that we can use any gateway to go directly to other realms now, but why not go all the way? Why couldn't the dwarves just give Kratos a jewel that allows him to open a gateway wherever he is in the realm to start fast travel? I'll tell you why, because the developers are so in love with their own world they can't bear the thought of players not wandering around in it for the maximum amount of time possible. <sighs> Coming back to the combat, runic attack cooldowns are harder to exploit, at least they are during the most important parts of the game. Mini bosses and main bosses aren't massacred by just spamming constant runic attacks, and there are no broken companion abilities like the old Atreus electric arrows. You actually have to fight, from beginning to end, and it's beautiful. I rarely ever felt like I made it through a late game encounter by just screwing around, and I never beat a boss by just stunlocking them with supers and companion attacks. Ragnarok makes you play well, and I have immense respect for it because of that. I really like most of the new enemy designs, even if a few of them really screw with the camera. The new big guys are fun, it's great to see more animal-like enemies, and having an enemy that you have to hunt down and kill before you can damage anyone else is a fun way to mix things up. I appreciate the variations of old enemies that appear, seeing how travelers might have a back attack this time around, or maybe they'll swing their sword up after it gets stuck in the ground. I enjoyed every encounter with the Hateful because it made me play well for so long. Everyone is suitably annoying and challenging and interesting in their own ways to make you feel good about finally killing them. Except the Wisps, they can fuck off. Wandering around in frozen Midgard, the canyons, and the jungle was the best experience I had in Ragnarok. I'd do a side mission at my own pace, find some gear or a new attack, solve a puzzle, and then run over to a boss fight for an hour. Then go out searching for another crazy fight, of which there are many. It became exciting to see what kind of loot I'd get after defeating an optional boss, because while I'm not a fan of loot-based games and I criticized 2018 for being heavily loot-based, I can't deny that it feels good to find something nice after winning a good fight. That's the difference here. The fights are actually good this time. 2018 felt like a series of unsatisfying and or broken combat encounters where the only joy to be found came from the loot drops. In Ragnarok, the big fights themselves are incredibly satisfying, so the loot feels like a reward and not compensation. I spent my days just wandering around looking for optional boss fights, avoiding the campaign because I knew the moment I went back to it, something awful would be waiting for me. I'd finally shrug my shoulders and say, okay, I'll see what's next in the campaign. And surprise, surprise, is a bunch of cutscenes and a terrible section where Atreus is in a bar fight. A section that actually made my girlfriend say, is this a joke? Are they laughing at us? Okay, so let's stay with the combat a little more because I want to talk about an aspect of this game that has become very important to me, something I talk about on this channel all the time, and that's player accountability, creative incentive, and clear communication of a game's core systems. Three things that are guaranteed to lead even your most stubborn player into the fun zone. And what is the fun zone of God of War Ragnarok? Weapon variety, smart use of runic attacks and managing cooldowns, dodging and parrying, guard breaking, long distance targeting, and combos. Engaging in all this stuff is what makes the game fun, and not all your players are going to start engaging in it if they can just get away with random bullshit for most of the game. 
The big difference in my experience with 2018 going into Ragnarok is that I felt like the fun way to play was now the right way to play. Overall, combat just feels more interesting this time around. That's due to enemy balance, runic attack balance, new combat options, and I really came to like the different kinds of Spartan Rage. Choosing from the classic punch 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 to regain health, a quick burst of health without doing damage, or a charging heavy attack that gives health if it kills someone. And since combat is better tuned this time around, thinking about which one to have equipped was actually fun. Before I get into what I really like about the new combat presentation, I gotta mention something that was horribly disappointing. In the early game, I learned that if you finish a fight with very low health, you will recover some of it automatically. I thought, oh my god, they changed the health system, yes! See, I have a big problem with 2018's health system, because you can play like crap in every fight, and survive with barely any health, and then if you go into the next fight, you can just die right away and you restart that checkpoint with full health. It's not like there's a ranking system like Bayonetta that punishes you for your deaths, you can just abuse it. So there's really no health resource reward for good defense. I was hoping they would restructure the game to have your current health level save with the checkpoint, and then you'd have to work harder to get health in the next fight, finding pickups, using rage to recover health, etc. It's also a problem for runic attack cooldowns, because they reset too. Let's say you finish a fight by using all your runic attacks, and then you go into the next fight and you have no runic attacks, so you gotta fight straight for a while. Well, just die and restart right there and get all your runic attacks back for free. It unfortunately leads you to being able to approach every fight the same way in the later game by opening big with runic attacks and then waiting for cooldown. It homogenizes combat encounters, and I'm really sad to see this hasn't been changed in Ragnarok. Seeing the small recharging health made me think they had done it, but they didn't. But I can't pretend they've done nothing. There's actually a fantastic reward for smart defense in the skill tree. If you land consistent hits while also avoiding damage, you build up elemental damage with your weapon, a feature from the last game. But now, when it maxes out, you can overcharge your weapon. Activating it stuns surrounding enemies, and then you unleash projectiles that do frost damage, like the old heavy runic attack from 2018 that was kinda busted, or you cause the blades to build up additional rage with every hit. I found myself excited whenever I got close to filling up the bar so I could power up and start wailing on the enemies, and I got pissed whenever someone hit me and I lost the charge before I could activate it. Good stuff! Fortunately, something that really helps is that you go quite a while without any heavy runic attacks, or at least I did. You're forced to legitimately play the game, being defensive, not relying on any kind of spam. And once you do start getting a lot of runic attacks, the enemies become balanced to be able to take a lot of punishment. So even though you are able to exploit the checkpoint system by instantly spawning with full health and runic attacks, at least that doesn't equal an easy win in most cases, where it did in 2018. Okay, so what are the combat improvements? I already mentioned how the game starts you with more options. That's important for early experimentation in a game like this. A big change in the combat presentation is in enemy weaknesses. We are shown early in the skill tree that frozen enemies take extra damage from blade attacks. Cool, weapon variety incentive. This also applies to burning enemies taking more damage from the axe. We have an early game mini boss in the Huntress that lets us stun her by throwing the axe at her horns, getting new players into the habit of long distance axe throwing, and capitalizing on enemy stun states. Energy shield enemies can be disabled by using runic arrows, but you can also use charged elemental attacks, runic attacks, and shield bash. Hexed enemies take extra elemental damage, which encourages the use of your spinning blade attack or charging frost on your axe. Some enemies protect their health bar in ways that are weak to different elemental attacks. You're given an early game choice of shield type, going with a tanky shield for steady defense, or a rewarding parry focus shield with a great counter attack ability. These are amazing ways to get players into experimenting with the tools they may be ignoring. In a change that I absolutely love, there are now tiers of skill use, and when you hit gold tier, you can insert a coin into that skill to enhance one of its properties. It's a really nice reward for using more than just the basic options available. So I like the changes to the skill tree, but I wish they didn't present the whole thing to you right away. 
It can be overwhelming, especially to a new player, to have three different categories, Axe, Blades, and Atreus, each with three different skill trees at the beginning of the game. I think you should be introduced to one set of skill trees each at first, and have the rest open up throughout the first hour. And I want to say thank you for allowing us to disable skills. Sometimes the evade skills really mess me up because they come out when I don't want it, and turning them off helps me in some fights. All of this, balance, combat options, clear weapon utility, mini boss weak points, skill tree rewards, it turned me, someone who found 2018's combat to be generally boring and busted, into someone having a great time, occasionally. Because it was never about what you can or can't do. I know that people do crazy combos in 2018, but I felt like that game failed at getting me interested in caring about combos in the first place. Ragnarok succeeds. Ragnarok makes great attempts at getting players into fun and effective playstyles. Maybe a little too much. I approve of the tutorial prompts, there are a lot of important mechanics to introduce, but these things tend to repeat themselves, and eventually you'll want to turn tutorials to minimal. You don't have to tell me over and over in one fight that hexed enemies are weak to elemental attacks. I got it. I definitely appreciate the addition of the flashing blue attacks that can be stopped with a shield bash. I never used shield bash in 2018, and this got me into using that attack much more, and now I really enjoy it. But it is very much a, hey, press this button now signal, which ends up feeling a bit dull after a while, and I think maybe there should be an option to disable it. Speaking of things that we should have the ability to disable, NPC hints. Your partner regularly yells at you, telling you to use your shield, telling you to parry an attack, stop standing still, attack an enemy at a certain time, and it's super annoying. I get it, you've got all kinds of players in this game. Yelling advice at them in the middle of combat can remind them of important things they should be doing. But for the love of God, let us disable it. You've got thousands of accessibility options in the menu, and you can't let us play without characters constantly telling us what to do? We've all seen this clip, haven't we? Oh my god, shut up! You have its attention now! Don't lose it! Oh my god! I will I legit mute the, the voices! Holy fuck, man! That's it! Don't relent! Oh fuck. Carry that attack! Oh my god! <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty bad, but what's worse is the puzzle sections. Now, I'm on record for criticizing 2018's puzzles, and while I do think in Ragnarok they're still limited by the lack of platforming, attempts have been made to make puzzles more interesting this time around, using the axe to freeze waterways and direct the water towards wheels to open doors, and the ability to string together runic arrows helps a lot of the puzzles feel like more than just throwing your axe at switches. So yeah, I praise the increase in puzzle variety, but my appreciation for these puzzles is frequently ruined by how often they appear. I like puzzles, okay? Survival horror is my favorite genre, and I love a puzzle that gets me thinking for 10 minutes about what to do. But not in every room. And not when none of them involve combat in an action game. Do people just not remember how much cool puzzle design was involved in the old games? The Minotaur boss wasn't just hitting him, you stunned him and made your way up to the launcher to impale him. There was a part where you had to protect a guy from killing himself while you were fending off monsters. You killed centaurs in a magic circle to unlock a door. You had to move a prisoner up a ramp for a sacrifice while enemies came at you. There was an elevator that would crush you if you didn't kill all the enemies in time. You did executions on sirens to use their voice to break open doors. God of War 3 had a cool section where zombies walk into a wall of energy and convert into large monsters, so you have to keep them away from it while fighting the big guys. This stuff makes the combat more than just strike and defend, with combat-free puzzles in between. It creates a larger experience, despite it actually being a shorter and linear game. 
I think it would have been cool to see some kind of puzzle where you have to juggle an enemy over a certain area for a while, and maybe this enemy has to be burning, but it dies quickly. So you have to figure out a way to get it burning with your spinning blade and then launch it and keep it in the air burning before it dies to open a door. Some kind of puzzle that actually teaches combat skills, not just stopping everything to be in a quiet room for several minutes, figuring out where to throw your axe. Without combat in any puzzle rooms, the game turns into a slog. God of War Ragnarok has a pacing problem. As I stated before, large amounts of the campaign and some side missions have you fighting a small group of enemies, two if you're lucky, and then solving a puzzle, in the middle of a bunch of walking, talking, and cutscenes. Alfheim is particularly bad about this, with constant rooms asking you to throw your axe at crystals to open doors. Imagine if instead of all these puzzles, they'd spent more time and resources on better designed combat spaces and some actual vertical combat options. They seem more interested in presenting traversal puzzles to the player than interesting combat scenarios, and the result is that puzzles that should be making me happy because they're well designed are having the opposite effect. I just want to experience the combat some more, but there's a locked door in my way and I gotta spend several minutes trying to figure it out. And right before I do actually figure it out, a character just blurts out the solution. Completely unwarranted. I think my arrows will stick to the wood up there. Nothing ruins a puzzle like being told the solution right as you're about to get it yourself. Other games have done this way better. I think it was Uncharted where if you need a hint you could press square and your friend would direct your attention to something. It would be great if they could rework it to be like that because knowing the puzzles are going to be spoiled for me definitely lessens my drive to want to replay this game. As if I would ever replay Ragnarok. I played 2018 once when it came out, and then three more times preparing for my original video. I played it twice on Hard, once on Extreme, and again on Extreme New Game Plus, which is admittedly a much better experience. My plan going into Ragnarok was to play it on the Give Me No Mercy difficulty and then Extreme, Give Me God of War. I wanted to get two solid playthroughs under my belt for this video, maybe 100%ing one of those playthroughs. But after suffering through so many unskippable cutscenes which last hours, boring as hell tasks where characters ask you to go fetch rocks for them so they can fix machines, and especially the god-awful Atreus levels which also take up hours, I refuse to play this game again. And it's sad because I would really like to just go around fighting all the bosses again, but not if it means I have to go through all that crap. A new game plus mode will not help this much because even if it lets us skip cutscenes, there's still hours and hours of walkie talkie climbing nonsense and unbearable Atreus levels. You think new game plus is going to come with an option to skip the Atreus levels? I don't think so. Maybe if I liked the story more, I could tolerate it. But Atreus is simply too much for me. I came to like the other characters. Brock and Sindri had some interesting developments. It was very sad to lose Brock and see Sindri become consumed by hate and ultimately be the one to kill Odin. It was actually a compelling part of the story. The epilogue scene saying goodbye to Brock was moving. Freya dealing with her trauma of being married to Odin was good to learn about. I became interested in Freya's forgiveness of Kratos and it was wonderful to see them become partners. Actually, the parts playing with Freya are way better than the ones with Atreus. She feels like a much more natural companion. The drama in Thor's family was interesting to me. Really, anything involving anyone other than Atreus, I found myself enjoying. But Kratos' part in all this, it's still very underwhelming to me. In most of the story, he's relegated to a Mad Max role, where he's not actually the main character in his movies. It's about the people he meets. And that's not a bad way to tell a story, but Kratos is such an interesting character that we've come to love and want to engage with more. I'm really disappointed to see him take a back seat to most of the story. He has his moments, yeah, and ultimately his journey ends up being more entertaining as he eventually becomes leader of the army to attack Asgard. That's a great destination to reach. Kratos never saw himself leading an army again. But the journey itself to get there? I don't know. I'm just not into it. Like I said, this is the Atreus story. Atreus drives the plot. There's actually this great moment where after we find out Tyr isn't who we thought he was, and Brock dies, Kratos and Atreus just leave. They're like, we're out. No more of this. And then you go back to your homeland and go hunting like everything is fine. 
I love this moment, and I wish there was a secret ending achievement somehow, where you just choose to never go back and let the world burn. Missed opportunity. Like the last game, the best moments for Kratos is when he's doing something that reminds him of his much more interesting adventures from the other games. He talks to Mimir about his brother Deimos, and when he's forced to strangle Heimdall to death, hearing him say monster as his final word, his eyes turning black, is a powerful moment because it brings us back to the person Kratos is on the inside, that darkness that he's trying his hardest to leave behind him. That's probably the most effective moment in the whole game. I have been falling back into my old ways. Heimdall is a very God of War 3 style boss. Super arrogant, teasing Kratos, pushing him to the limits of his patience. And near the end of the fight, when you think you've won, Kratos rushes in and that old God of War fan in me was screaming for him to just rip his head off. That's what I wanted. I got really excited. That's the darkness of the old Kratos that's inside me. But he only impales his arm, pinning him to the wall, giving him a chance to surrender. The adrenaline was pumping through me, and I sat there anxiously waiting to see what would happen next. I tried to calm myself, as Kratos was, resisting the urge to kill him. I was trying to take the higher path with Kratos. When Heimdall refuses to yield, threatening Atreus, Kratos rips his arm off. A brutal punishment for disobedience, but still not murder. He's doing whatever he can to refrain from killing another god. But when Heimdall comes at him again, Kratos understands that there is no other option, suffocating the life out of Heimdall, giving him some kind of victory by revealing to him the Kratos that he was and probably always will be deep down. This is great stuff. A game centered around these themes would make me very happy. Sadly, most of the game's story is centered around our unlikable son that fucks everything up and all the side characters, eventually ending with us waging war on Asgard to save the realms, and it's all just kinda okay. It's a noble cause, but it wasn't very exciting by this point. The fights in Asgard to get to the end are pretty unremarkable, and I think I was just getting tired of the combat by that point, so there's that too. The Odin and Thor boss fights are genuinely fun, but they're spoiled by one too many checkpoints. And as we know, checkpoints spawn you with full resources, so you can empty six runic attacks into them right away when you load a checkpoint. It makes the fights less interesting and challenging than they could have been. The best part of the final chapter is seeing Kratos become the general. Seeing everyone refer to him as their leader is a moving scene. Because Kratos never saw himself taking this position again, and now the whole world is depending on him for their survival, instead of him being on a mission that destroys the world like he was in God of War 3. It's great character development. It's why I ultimately like this game's story a little more than 2018's, because despite all the terrible focus on Atreus, by the end, Kratos is in a very interesting place, and I like that. He says goodbye to his son in a scene that is incredibly touching. It almost brought a tear to my eye. So where does that leave us? The story of Ragnarok is over. It's a huge game, it was enough story for two games, but they wanted to wrap it all up in this one giant adventure. Was it too much? I don't know. I'm not used to having to play a game for a week to complete it, so I'm tempted to say yes. But I also did a lot of side content, spent hours in optional boss fights, and I intentionally put off finishing the campaign because of the Atreus levels. So maybe it's not too much. It probably depends on how you experience it. Personally, I feel like the ability to go on side missions detracts from the urgency of the plot. Odin is this great threat that we need to assemble an army to stop, and Kratos is upset about his son disappearing, but hey, why don't you relax for a bit and go run errands for ghosts? It's so weird. And I guess it also speaks to my preference for linear action games. I always felt the momentum of the story in the original God of War games, because you're going in one direction. You never took five hours out of your day to go fart around in a desert on your mission to kill Ares or Zeus. I did feel good about raising the dam and restoring water to the canyons, though. That was a side mission that felt like it had purpose and a real effect on the world. If only this was a linear action game and that was just part of the story. Now that I've beaten the campaign, seen the epilogue, found most of the Asgardian wreckage, beaten eight of the Berserker boss fights, including a few fights versus the camera, I think I'm done. The wreckage fights have been very underwhelming, I feel no drive to find new gear, the remaining side quests involve a lot of empty wandering around, and yeah, I may go look for a few more boss fights in my spare time, but honestly, I'm just getting tired of the navigation. 
I already mentioned it, but the inability to fast travel at any time is really hindering this experience for me. I got lost in a part of Vanaheim up here and I decided to make my way back to a gateway because I couldn't find one up here. Maybe there is one here and I just didn't find it. I couldn't find my way to the undiscovered area, so maybe it's up there. But because I didn't find one here, I had to run all the way back down the map, running in circles a couple times because I got turned around, and I spent like 10 minutes just running around in the jungle trying to get to a gateway. To do what? Go run around some more? That's when I officially soured on this game. It's so pretentious, they expect me to be happy retreading these dead environments looking for treasure or something. Unable to fast travel anywhere unless I make a 5 minute trek back. It's insulting. But at least it's over. There is no reason at all to replay this game, so I can be done with it. I can look back on my fond memories of boss fights when I actually said, wow, I love this, and the touching moments that happen in the story, the beautiful environments, and I can try my hardest to forget nearly everything else. God of War Ragnarok was the most complicated game I've ever played or talked about. It is better than 2018 in many ways. I'd say it's a better game overall. But the major flaws this game has in certain areas, combined with the incredibly bloated campaign story moments with unskippable walkie-talkie cutscenes and five hours of Atreus missions, are, in my opinion, unforgivable. The good stuff keeps me from saying it's a bad game. Hell, in the end I never even said the last game was bad, it just had a lot of bad stuff in it. This game isn't bad either, it's half really good and half really bad. The good stuff is better than it was in 2018, but the bad stuff is way worse. The incredible potential this game shows is brought down at nearly every turn, and that's what I call ruined. Thank you for watching this video, it's been an emotional ride. Let's hope the next God of War game goes in a different direction. I don't think I can take another one of these.